Just a few minutes ago, uh, I took this picture uh, about 10 blocks from here. This is the Grand Cafe uh, here in Oxford. I took this picture because this turns out to be the first coffee house to open in England in, in 1650. That's its great claim to fame. And I wanted to show it to you not because I want to give you the kind of, you know, Starbucks tour of historic England, uh, but rather because the English coffee house was crucial to the development uh, and spread of one of the great intellectual flowerings uh, of the last 500 years, what we now call the Enlightenment. And the coffee house played such a big role in, in the birth of the Enlightenment, in part because of what people were drinking there, right? Because before the, uh, the, the spread of coffee and, and tea through British culture, what people drank, both elite and, and mass folks drank day in and day out from, from dawn until dusk, was alcohol, right? Alcohol was the daytime beverage of choice. You would drink a little beer with breakfast and have a little wine at lunch, a little gin, particularly around 1650, um, and uh, top it off with a little beer and, and wine at the end of the day. That was the healthy choice, right? Because the water wasn't safe to drink. Uh, and so effectively, in, until the rise of the coffee house, you had an entire population that was effectively drunk all day. Um, <laughs> And you can imagine what that would be like, right, in your own life, and I know this is true of some of you, if you were drinking all day, and, and then you switched from a depressant to a stimulant in your life, you would have better ideas. Um, you would be sharper and more alert, and so it's not an accident that a great flowering of innovation happened uh, as England switched to, to tea and coffee. But the other thing that makes the coffee house important is the, is the architecture of the space. It was a space where people would get together from different backgrounds, different fields of expertise, and share. It was a space, as Matt Ridley talked about, where ideas could have sex, right? This was their conjugal bed, in a sense. Ideas would get together there. And an astonishing number of innovations from this period have a coffee house somewhere in, in, in their story. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about coffee houses for the last five years uh, because I've been kind of in, on this quest to investigate this question of where good ideas come from. What are the environments that lead to unusual levels of innovation, um, unusual levels of, of, of creativity? What's the kind of environmental, what is the space of creativity? And what I've done is I've looked at both environments, like the coffee house, I've looked at like media environments, like the World Wide Web, that have been extraordinarily innovative. I've gone back to the, the, the history of the first cities. I've even gone to biological environments, like coral reefs and, and rainforests, that involve unusual levels of biological innovation. And what I've been looking for is shared patterns, kind of signature behavior that shows up again and again in all of these environments. Are there recurring patterns that we can learn from, that we can take and kind of apply to our own lives, or our own organizations, our own environments, to make them more creative and innovative. And I think I've found a few. But what you have to do to make sense of this and to really understand these principles is you have to do away with a lot of the, the way in which our kind of conventional metaphors and language steers us towards certain concepts of idea creation, right? We have this very rich vocabulary to describe moments of inspiration, right? We have the kind of the flash of insight, the stroke of insight, we have epiphanies, we have eureka moments, uh, we have the light bulb moments, right? All of these concepts, as, as kind of rhetorically florid as they are, share this basic assumption, which is that an idea is a single thing. It's something that happens often in a, in a wonderful, uh, illuminating moment. But in fact, what I would argue, and what you really need to kind of begin with, is this idea that an idea is a network on the most elemental level, right? I mean, this is what is happening inside your brain. An idea, a new idea, is a new network of neurons firing in sync with each other inside your brain. It's a new configuration that is never formed before, right? And the question is, how do you get your brain into environments where these new networks are going to be more likely to form? And it turns out that, in fact, the kind of network patterns of the outside world mimic a lot of the network patterns of the internal world of the, of the human brain. So the metaphor I, I'd like to use is actually, I can take from, from a story of, of a great idea um, that, that's quite recent, a lot more recent than the, the 1650s. Uh, a, a wonderful guy named Timothy Prestero who has a company called, an organization called Design That Matters. They decided to tackle this really pressing problem uh, of you know, you know, the, the terrible problems we have with infant mortality rates in the, 
in the developing world. One of the things that's very frustrating about this is that we know by getting modern neonatal incubators into uh, you know, any context, if we can keep premature babies warm, basically, it's very simple, we can have infant mortality rates in those environments. So the technology is there, we have these, these are standard in, in all the industrialized worlds. The problem is, if you buy a $40,000 incubator, and you send it off to a mid-sized village in Africa, it will work great for a year or two years, and then something will go wrong, and it will break, and it will remain broken forever because you don't have a whole system of spare parts and you don't have the on-the-ground expertise to fix this $40,000 piece of equipment. And so you end up having this problem where you spend all this money getting aid and all this advanced electronics to these countries and then it ends up being useless. So what Prestro and his team decided to do is to look around and see what are the kind of abundant resources in these developing world contexts. And what they noticed was they don't have a lot of DVRs, they don't have a lot of microwaves, but they seem to do a pretty good job of keeping their cars on the road, right? There's a Toyota 4Runner on the, on the street and all, in all these places. They seem to have the expertise to keep cars working. So they started to think, could we build a neonatal incubator that's built entirely out of automobile parts? And this is what they ended up coming with. It's called the Neo Nurture device. From the outside, it looks like a normal little thing you'd find in a modern Western hospital. In the inside, it's all car parts. It's got a fan, it's got headlights for warmth, it's got door chimes for alarm, it runs off a car battery. And so all you need is the spare parts from your Toyota and the ability to fix a headlight, and you can repair this thing. Now, that's a great idea, but what I'd like to say is that, in fact, this is a great metaphor for the way that ideas happen. We like to think our breakthrough ideas you know, are like that $40,000 brand new incubator, state-of-the-art technology. But more often than not, they're cobbled together from whatever parts that happen to be around nearby. We take ideas from other people, from people we've learned from, from people we run into in the coffee shop, and we stitch them together into new forms and we create something new. That's really where innovation happens. And that means that we have to change some of our models of kind of what innovation and deep thinking really looks like, right? I mean, this is one vision of it. Another is Newton and the apple. This is a statue, though Newton was in Cambridge, this is a statue from Oxford, you know, where you're sitting there thinking a deep thought and the apple falls from the tree and you have a theory of gravity. In fact, the spaces that have historically led to innovation tend to look like this, right? This is Hogarth's famous painting of a kind of political dinner at a tavern, but this is what the coffee shops looked like back then. This is the kind of chaotic environment where ideas were likely to come together, where people were likely to have kind of new, interesting, unpredictable collisions, people from different backgrounds. So if we're trying to build organizations that are more innovative, we have to build spaces that, strangely enough, look a little bit more like this. This is what your office should look like. It's part of my message here. Um, and one of the problems with this is that people are actually, when you, when you research this field, people are notoriously unreliable when they actually kind of self-report on where they have their own good ideas or their history of, uh, of their best ideas. And a few years ago, a wonderful researcher named Kevin Dunbar decided to go around and basically do the big brother approach to figuring out where good ideas come from. He went to a bunch of science labs around the world and videotaped everyone um, as they were doing every little bit of their job. So when they were sitting in front of the microscope, when they were talking to their colleagues at the water cooler and all these things, and he, and he recorded all these conversations and tried to figure out where the most important ideas, where they happened. And when we think about the, you know, the classic image of the scientist in the lab, we have this image, you know, they're pouring over the microscope and they see something you know, in the tissue sample and, oh, eureka, they've got the idea. What happened actually when Dunbar kind of looked at the tape is that in fact, Almost all the important breakthrough ideas did not happen alone in the lab in front of the microscope. They happened at the conference table at the weekly lab meeting when everybody got together and shared their kind of latest data and, and, and findings. Oftentimes, when people shared the mistakes they were having, the error, the noise, and the signal they were, they were discovering. And something about that environment, and I've started calling it the kind of the liquid network, where you have lots of different eyes, ideas that are together, different backgrounds, different interests, jostling with each other, bouncing off each other, that environment is, in fact, the environment that leads to innovation. The other problem that people have is they like to condense their stories of innovation down to kind of shorter time frames. So they want to tell the story of the eureka moment. They want to say, there I was, I was standing there, and I had it all suddenly clear in my head. But in fact, if you go back and look at the historical record, it turns out that a lot of important ideas have very long incubation periods. I call this the slow hunch. We've heard a lot recently about, you know, kind of hunch and instinct and kind of blink-like uh, sudden moments of clarity. But in fact, a lot of great ideas linger on sometimes for decades. 
in the back of people's minds. They have a feeling that there's an interesting problem, but they don't quite have the tools yet to discover them. Um, they spend all this time, you know, kind of working on certain problems, but there's another thing lingering there that they're interested in, but they can't quite solve. Darwin is a great example of this. Darwin himself, in his autobiography, tells the story of coming up with the idea for natural selection as a classic eureka moment. He's in his uh, study, it's October of 1838, and he's reading Malthus, actually, on population. And all of a sudden, the basic algorithm of natural selection kind of pops into his head, and he says, ah, at last, I had a theory with which to work. That's in his autobiography. About a decade or two ago, a, a wonderful scholar named Howard Gruber went back and looked at Darwin's notebooks from, these, from this period. And Darwin kept these copious notebooks where he wrote down every little idea he had, every little hunch. And what Gruber found was that Darwin had the full theory of natural selection for months and months and months before he had his alleged epiphany reading Malthus in, in October of 1838. There are passages where you can read it and you, and you think like you're reading from a Darwin textbook um, from the period before he has his epiphany. And so what you realize is that Darwin, in a sense, had the idea, he had the concept, but was un, unable of fully thinking it yet. And that is actually how great ideas often happen. They fade into view over long periods of time. Now, the challenge for all of us is, how do you create environments that allow these ideas to have this kind of long half-life, right? It's hard to go to your boss and say, I have an excellent idea for our organization. It will be useful in 2020. Uh, <laughs> could you just give me some time to do that? Now, a couple of companies like Google, they have innovation time off, 20% time, where in a sense, those are hunch cultivating uh, mechanisms in an organization. But that's, that's a, a key thing. And the other thing is to allow those hunches to connect with other people's hunches. That's what often happens. You have half of an idea, somebody else has the other half, and if you're in the right environment, they turn into something larger than the sum of their parts. So in a sense, we often talk about the value of protecting intellectual property, you know, building barricades, having secretive R&D labs, um, patenting everything that we have, so that those ideas will remain valuable and people will be incentivized to come up with more ideas and, and the culture will be more innovative. But I think there's a case to be made that we should spend at least as much time, if not more, valuing the premise of connecting ideas and not just protecting them. And I'll leave you with this story, which I think captures a lot of these values. Um, and it's just a, just a wonderful kind of tale of innovation and how it happens in unlikely ways. It's October of 1957, and Sputnik has just launched. And we're in Laurel, Maryland, at the uh, Applied Physics Lab associated with Johns Hopkins University. And it's Monday morning, and the news is just broken about this satellite that's now orbiting the planet. And of course, this is nerd heaven, right? Uh, there are all these physics geeks who are there thinking, oh my gosh, this is incredible. I can't believe this has happened. And two of them, two 20-something researchers at the APL, are there at the cafeteria table having an informal conversation with a bunch of their colleagues. And these two guys are named Geyer and Weifenbach. And they start talking, and, and one of them says, hey, you know, has anybody tried to listen for this thing? There's this you know, man-made satellite up there in outer space that's obviously broadcasting some kind of signal. We could probably hear it if we tune in. And so they ask around to a couple of their colleagues, and, and everybody's like, no, I hadn't thought of doing that. That's, you know, that's an interesting idea. And it turns out Weifenbach is kind of an ex expert in microwave uh, reception, and he's got a little antenna set up with an amplifier in his office. And so Geyer and Weifenbach go back to Weifenbach's office, and they start kind of noodling around, hacking, as we might call it now. And after a couple of hours, they actually start picking up this signal, because the Soviets made um, Sputnik very easy to track. It was right at 20 megahertz, so that you could, you could pick it up really easily, because they were afraid that people would think it was a hoax, basically. So they made it really easy to, to find it. And so these two guys are sitting there listening to this signal, and, and people start kind of coming into the office and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. Can I hear? Wow, that's great. And, and before long, they think, well, geez, this is kind of historic. We may be the first people in the United States to be listening to this. We should record it. And so they bring in this big, clunky analog tape recorder, and they start recording these little bleep, bleeps, um, and they start writing down the kind of date stamp, time stamps for each, for each little bleep that they record. And then they start thinking, well, gosh, you know, we're noticing small little frequency variations here. We could probably calculate the speed that the satellite is traveling if we, if we do a little basic math here using the, the Doppler effect. And then they played around with it a little bit more, and they talked to a couple of their colleagues who had other kind of specialties. And they said, geez, you know, I think we could actually look at the slope of the Doppler effect to figure out the points at which 
the satellite is closest to our antenna and the points at which it's furthest away. That's pretty cool. And eventually they get permission, this is all a little side project that you know, hadn't been officially part of their job description. But they get permission to use the new you know, Univac computer that takes up an entire room that they'd just gotten at the APL. And they, they run some more of the numbers. And at the end of about three or four weeks, it turns out they have mapped the exact trajectory of this satellite around the Earth just from listening to this one little signal going off on this little side